My name's Kelly McIntosh and I am a senior lecturer in sport and exercise science at Swansea University in South Wales. Although I originally started doing a maths degree at the University of Bath, I soon realised that this wasn't the right career path for me. However, I still stayed on at the University of Bath and completed a BSc in sport and exercise science before going on to Loughborough University to study a master's degree in sports science. Following this, I then completed my doctorate in children's physical activity and health at Liverpool John Moores University. My primary research interest is promoting children's physical activity, and this is done through numerous different ways, but mainly through school-based physical activity interventions. During my PhD, I was involved in designing a curriculum-based intervention called CHANGE, which stands for Children's Health, Activity and Nutrition Get Educated. This was done in order to improve primary school children's well-being through enhanced physical activity and healthy eating behaviours. For this particular research, I actually won the Young Investigators Award at the Pre-Olympic International Conference in 2012. However, one of the biggest problems we actually have with physical activity interventions is that children don't necessarily understand how much activity they need to actually do. Physical activity is defined as any bodily movement produced by skeletal muscles resulting in energy expenditure above resting. Current physical activity guidelines recommend that children should engage in at least 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity every day. However, despite this, as little as 24% of children in England and less than a third of children in Wales are actually meeting these government guidelines. And when more stringent methods of physical activity are assessed, this figure can be as little as 5.2% of children in Europe. And again, one of the key suggested barriers is that they're difficult to measure, interpret and apply in terms of everyday activities. There are numerous health implications associated with low physical activity levels such as heart disease, stroke, osteoporosis, type 2 diabetes, certain cancers, depression, anxiety, stress, and of course, there's obesity. This map is of a small area called the Wirral, just outside of Liverpool in northwest England. The different colours represent fifths of BMI, with the lightest blue being the thinnest and the red being the fattest area. As we progress through the years, you can see how the different areas actually change from 1988 all the way through to 2003. This is of great concern considering that this BMI is of three-year-olds. Therefore, increasing the physical activity levels of children is of key importance. And it's not just our kids that are getting fatter, even our pets are getting fatter as well. According to Hill's pet research, 50% of the dogs and cats in the UK are overweight. However, of more concern, 76% of the owners think their pets are of a healthy weight. Given that 67% of pet owners in Europe are overweight, this suggests that we actually now perceive a healthy weight as the average weight, which is increasing over time. However, it's not just a lack of physical activity that's a problem, it's an increase in the time spent being sedentary. The Sedentary Behaviour Research Network defines sedentary behaviour as any waking activity characterised by an energy expenditure of less than or equal to 1.5 mets and a sitting or reclining posture. Those of you unaware, one met is the amount of energy we expend simply to exist. So 1.5 mets, or one and a half times the energy simply to exist, is not a great deal of energy. What's important to remember is that sedentary behaviour and physical activity can coexist. For example, a highly trained athlete could easily surpass the physical activity guidelines, but still engage in a lot of sedentary behaviour. This is of a key concern because sedentary behaviour has an independent and significant impact on health. So essentially, the message is simple. To improve the UK's health, we need to move more and sit less. However, what seems like such a simple task is not. Our whole society faces an increasing array of sedentary behaviours, which are far more reinforcing than physically active alternatives. We've evolved from the hunter-gatherer days, where we were really active and had nutritious meals, right the way through the years, where we can now sit in a car go to a drive through and get the unhealthiest meals possible. There's very little energy expenditure that's associated with typing in a PIN code. But don't worry about that, now we have contactless payment, so we can expend even less energy. Technology's advanced so much that we've gone from a couple of decades ago, where we had large TVs, but we were quite thin, right the way through the years, where we've now got really thin TVs, but we're a lot bigger. And when we do watch TV, we watch people on TV 
watching TV because that's just what we do. And even the people who we can get to the gym still have this modern mindset. So there's clearly a problem to be tackled. As researchers, we use accelerometers to measure children's physical activity levels. However, it's still hard to accurately assess the corresponding energy expenditure. If we as researchers are still unsure as to the amount and how to quantify it, then how can we really expect children to know what 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity actually is and whether they've actually achieved it? So with this in mind, in September 2014, I applied for the Winston Churchill Memorial Trust Travel Fellowship Grant. These fellowships provide a unique opportunity for UK citizens from all backgrounds in every corner of the UK to acquire innovative ideas abroad. The fellowships receive over 1,200 applications every year and award only 100 fellowships annually. So applying for a fellowship in the science, technology and innovation category, I was one of the 240 applicants to be shortlisted for interview. After a successful, albeit difficult, interview, I was very grateful and extremely honoured to be awarded the fellowship to travel to Australia, to work with Associate Professor Michael Rosenberg at the University of Western Australia and Dr Nicola Ridgers at Deakin University. The aim of this specific fellowship was to build on research links in Australia and pass a knowledge gain to the wider benefit of others in the UK. The aim of my fellowship was to explore the measurement and visualisation of children's physical activity levels. There are numerous methods of measuring physical activity levels in children. However, the majority are either subjective in nature, such as questionnaires, or are reliant on arbitrary accelerometer classifications and these fail to account for the broad spectrum of behaviours and movements typically observed in children. In order to tease out the relationships between physical activity and health, and the mediating influence of interventions on them, it's important to accurately measure and interpret physical activity data. Accelerometers tend to be used to measure children's physical activity levels, as they are thought to provide the optimal trade-off between feasibility and validity. Australia are specialising in computer science data analyses as well as novel physical activity interventions. It was envisaged that accelerometry data representative of children's activity could be analysed using machine learning through the application of computer science expertise and this would identify specific patterns which correspond to particular movements. Such research activity will enable the development of a visual feedback tool for children which conceptualises their physical activity relative to current guidelines. So, imagine this, a sphere that can not only provide us with the information on how active children are, but also provide us with the information of what behaviours they've actually done to achieve this. This is exactly what Dr Alex Rowlands, based in Australia, and his team started to do with the sedentary sphere using the gene-active wrist-worn accelerometers. Essentially, the orientation of the wrists can be demonstrated on a sphere, as shown in this 2D diagram. So, if you moved your wrist in every possible way, you produce clusters all over the sphere. This can allow key behaviours to be identified from the data. For example, sitting on the train, walking around, or even doing household activities. And the greater the acceleration associated with this, the further the clusters appear from the surface of the sphere. Before leaving for Australia, a lot of work was completed with Dr Mark Holton, Professor Rory Wilson and Professor Hugh Summers. This involved using custom-made accelerometer, which can measure up to 800 hertz. That's 800 time points every second. The use of these custom-made accelerometers with an inbuilt triaxial accelerometer allows us to gain information on the exact orientation of the device. And if we know where the children are wearing them, we can then get more information on their particular behaviours. So, with all this in mind, I set upon my journey to Australia, with the first stop being Perth. Dr Michael Rosenberg, an Associate Professor at the University of Western Australia, hosted me for the first half of my fellowship. Dr Rosenberg's group have made some great advances in the use of the Connect as a monitoring tool. Specifically, the Connect uses structured light and machine learning, which can infer the body's position in a two-stage process. First, it computes a depth map using structured light, then infers body position using machine learning. Essentially the depth form focuses using the principle that body parts that are more blurry are therefore further away. The idea to move forward and link the UK research with Australia is that specific patterns may emerge in the accelerometer data. 
When this occurs, we can not only predict the associated energy expenditure for measuring oxygen uptake, in other words the amount of energy it's taken to perform that particular movement, but we can actually see what movement was performed. For example, if the child is standing in this particular position, does the data provide us with the information to tell us this? Since returning to the UK, we have submitted a paper for review which builds on unique collaborations between engineers, computer scientists, biologists and exercise and health scientists. For this, 9 to 11 year old children performed fundamental physical activity movements monitored over a 30 minute period. They did this using triaxial accelerometers worn on nine different anatomical positions, both ankles, knees, hips, wrists and one in the centre of the chest. This research is growingly important in the physical activity field as it answers the question of which location do we need children to wear an accelerometer to accurately assess their physical activity, but also whether one accelerometer is enough. This data analysis used artificial neural networks and specifically created links with Dr. Alex Montoy of Ball State University. It's hoped that the validation of finalised energy expenditure algorithms will be conducted against large data sets of Australian children's physical activity levels. Patterns within the data will also be investigated to produce a visually appealing display of both mobility and intensity, which will enable children to ascertain the current physical activity levels. Throughout the trip, I travelled down the coast attending several meetings organised by the University of Western Australia's Health Promotion Evaluation Unit. During this trip, we collected and exchanged information on how it's best to evaluate health promotion initiatives. As part of this, the unit delivered workshops on implementing and evaluating these health promoting interventions. These workshops enabled interactions with people delivering health promoting interventions to children and provided ideas of what could be implemented in the UK. It also provided a great insight into how to evaluate these interventions and how novel ideas and concepts could be integrated. In addition to all of this, I had meetings with over 20 researchers to discuss potential overlap on how we could integrate Australia's current research to create impact within the UK. This also included meetings with professors at Curtin University as well. Following a successful and very rich experience in Perth, I headed to Melbourne to be hosted by Dr Nicola Ridges at Deakin University. During my time at Deakin University, I presented my research at two separate seminars, one to the Centre for Physical Activity and Nutrition Research and the other to the School for Health and Social Development. This enabled discussions between colleagues based at Deakin University about how the UK could better interpret the levels of children's physical activity. Following these seminars, I had numerous different meetings with some world-renowned academics, including Professor Joe Salmon and Associate Professor Anna Temperio. Much of the work conducted at Deakin University, and specifically around Dr Nicola Ridge's research, incorporates analysing children's recess periods and whether promoting more active behaviours during these periods, or other specific periods, has a compensatory effect either later on in the day or even the next day. This has perhaps highlighted the need to account for children's patterns of physical activity and many links have emerged to integrate research from the UK with the expertise of academics in Australia. Specifically, we're currently revisiting data collected from the Change Project and investigating the impact of different variables, such as the weather, sex and available playground space, on children's physical activity levels during recess. Dr Ridges and I are also analysing some UK-specific playground behaviour data in collaboration with Dr Kate Ridley, based at Flinders University, in order to update a universal compendium on children's physical activities. Many concepts discussed appear to link in well with some of the earlier work conducted in the UK around promoting visual feedback for children to motivate them to be more physically active. For example, a project called Mission Possible set out to provide children with near real-time visual feedback. This feasibility study integrated a Monday morning mission whereby children would watch a mission on an iPad, which was a film for free runner going into their specific school to set a mission for them. The class was then split into 10 groups who were assigned a specific colour. Each team wore an associated Fitbit zip during the mission, and when they came back into the classroom, this synced up through the school's Wi-Fi system and displayed their physical activity levels on an LED strip around the classroom. So for example, if the children in the pink team came back in, the length of the pink strip was how active they were and how fast it flashed was how intense the activity was. Focus groups revealed that the children absolutely loved the feedback and found the intervention really exciting. 
Teachers also felt that it was great because those children who wouldn't usually participate in PE saw it as a fun game rather than an active game and that children didn't feel exposed as the feedback was part of a team. However, although the children really liked the competition as part of a team, they stated that they would still like individual feedback. They came up with two key things. The first one was that they wanted to see or feel how active they were, and the second one was that they wanted competition against their dogs. Interestingly, whilst at the University of Western Australia, I met with Dr Hayley Christian, who researches the relationship between dog ownership and physical activity. It's therefore hoped that we can work together to bring this research further forward. And with regards to being able to see or feel their physical activity levels, this seemed to link perfectly to the expertise within the Exertion Games Lab, based in Melbourne, who have conducted some fantastic work around using a 3D printer to provide tangible objects for adults based on their heart rates. Since returning to the UK, we're currently undertaking research on whether printing out children's physical activity levels to form a tangible 3D object will help children understand when they are, or more importantly aren't, doing physical activity. Not only will this allow UK children to understand their physical activity and sedentary behaviours, but it will provide us with a better knowledge as to the type of behaviours that children are doing and when they're doing them, as well as how this links to health outcomes. Specifically, we hope to integrate some of our previous work, led by Professor Rory Wilson, on the G-sphere. This earlier work has evolved from animals. For example, if you look at this picture of an elephant seal, Essentially, you can see that it goes round and round and round, just doing lots and lots of somersaults, occasionally going slightly off course, and then carrying on doing lots and lots of somersaults again. And if we look at the red raft lemur, you see that they move in every single way possible, forming a near perfect sphere. And then if we look at a water bowl, they essentially do next to nothing. And I suspect that this might be close to some of the patterns we get from our own children. So. It's our intention that if we can provide children with a printed model of their activity levels, it will allow them to visualise what they've done and how much. Essentially, the bigger the printout, the more they've done, and the shape would allow them to know how many different movements they've done. If they get a printout the size of a pea, and they've only watched TV all day, it might get them thinking. Similarly, if they've done something really active, and they get a big printout with lots and lots of spikes, Hopefully they can start to identify what they've done to get that shape. Beyond my time being hosted at Deakin University, I also presented to the Institute of Sport, Exercise and Active Living at Victoria University, hosted by Professor Stuart Biddle, who is a world-renowned professor in physical activity and health. And beyond this even further, I also met up with the world-renowned professors David Dunstan and Neville Owen at Baker IDI Heart and Diabetes Institute as well as speaking to numerous academics from La Trobe University. Whilst I met with numerous academics, meetings in particular with Dr Brad Aisbert and Dr Nicola Ridges at Deakin University not only motivated me personally, but extended the scope of the original vision of this fellowship. Such movement visualisations can go far beyond children's physical activity, but linking with monitoring firefighters or nurses, for example, and predicting fatigue from changes in movement patterns or looking at associated energy expenditure. It's hoped that these monitors will be shared between the UK and Australia in order to collect data in an attempt to answer such important questions. So the development and evaluation of tools to accurately assess and promote children's physical activity levels, and consequently their relationship with health and well-being, is absolutely essential. They could have a significant influence on the evaluation of worldwide physical activity interventions, which could consequently impact on international physical activity guidelines and initiatives. Visual feedback could be utilised by children to inform, educate and motivate them regarding their current and recommended levels of physical activity. I believe that such novel analysis and aesthetically pleasing feedback of physical activity levels could not only influence government policies and help to ameliorate the childhood obesity epidemic, but further collaboration in physical activity and health, as well as my personal career path as an early career researcher. With the knowledge gained through this trip and a solid relationship built between the University of Western Australia, Swansea University and Deakin University, I've come back to the UK with a long-term aim of enabling children to understand what behaviours lead to them either meeting or failing to meet the government's physical activity guidelines. There is no doubt that this fellowship has been worthwhile. I would like to thank the University of Western Australia and Deakin University 
and specifically Dr. Nicola Ridgers and Dr. Michael Rosenberg for allowing me to undertake my fellowship based at their institutions. But I'd also like to thank them for their advice and support, which goes far beyond the scope of this fellowship. I'd also like to thank my colleagues for supporting me in taking the time to complete this fellowship, with specific thanks to Dr. Melita McNary, who was significantly involved in the majority of this research. Lastly, I'd like to thank my PhD student, Sam Crossley, for helping me compile this report. Everyone that I met in regards to the research had a great passion for the young people that they worked with and getting the best for them. It was infectious and inspiring, and I hope that this report reflects just a small part of the excellent work being conducted in Australia in the hope we can have an impact on UK children.